word. I'm gonna say the word. In the beginning was the word. What? Word. 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 Was the word. From the studios of KJZZ in Phoenix, Arizona, welcome to Word, a podcast about literature in Arizona and the region. Here's your host, Tom Maxidon. Coming up on this episode of Word, how does an addiction to an anti-anxiety drug lead to writing a newly released mystery novel? My main character, Maya, when we meet her, is going through Klonopin withdrawal. And at the time, I was going through Klonopin withdrawal when I started writing the book. Plus, the haiku train is still running down the tracks, and the KJZZ annual haiku writing contest keeps on chugging. This year's theme? Write a poem about something you want to reset in your life. Cherish the outdoors. TikTok, Snapchat, Netflix gone. Hike, run, swim, explore. And the beloved Festival of Japan, better known as Arizona Mount Suri, returns to Phoenix in person the last weekend of this month. On display, even more haiku. We've received some haiku from elementary school students that are just stunning in the way they hit you. But first, Tempe resident Jeffrey Cronenfeld is an author and former inmate who draws on his time spent in prison for his new graphic novel, Dog Years. It was illustrated by local artist Russ Kazmierziak Jr. Cronenfeld says his relationship to public radio goes way back, as his dad listened to it when driving him to school as a kid, and a public radio station in another state was a real lifeline to him when he was incarcerated. When we caught up recently, he opened up from the start with frank discussion about what led to his time served. I always kind of liked, in addition to comics, I also liked cannabis. Uh, that used to be really illegal. Now it's like totally legal, which is awesome. It's also just a crazy change to see in my lifetime that I had sort of, when I was younger, I never thought it would be something that changed. But I'm really glad that it, you know, is something where, you know, people aren't going to get sent to prison anymore. For that kind of stuff. But so I uh, was up in Oregon. And I kind of got a long rap sheet, honestly. I got arrested. And a lot of this is explored in the comic. I got arrested at a protest, protesting the Iraq war when I was 18. I That ended up getting thrown out. It was an illegal arrest. I got beat up by some cops pretty bad. And uh, oh, I did a night in the Horseshoe in Madison. And it kind of changed my life. And I just had a lot of unresolved anger at the system and everything coming out of that. And it sort of led me to identify as kind of a criminal. I eventually tried to cement shut the entrance to Fashion Square Mall, which I was part of like an affinity group. We were like kind of wacky activist prankster guys. The court system didn't think it was as funny as we did. So we ended up getting busted by like an undercover cop and got some felonies. And that really made it difficult. I had to drop out of college. I had a bunch of restitution. I had to pay like I I don't know the exact figure, but it was a lot of money. And so then uh, when the 2008 came and, you know, there was the whole economic collapse, I just could not get a job up in Portland. And I was working construction and I was helping building secret gardens for people in their basements. And it just seemed like a way to basically be an alchemist to turn, you know, uh, animal feces into gold, essentially. (laughs) And uh, I started growing it. And then I started kind of distributing it across the country and Eventually, I kind of lost my mind a little bit. I was doing a lot of substances. I was super stressed about going to prison. I was always getting robbed and people were trying to blackmail me. And eventually, I kind of lost it and got an altercation with a former girlfriend. That's how I got sent to prison. That's quite a story, but you've changed your life. And was it your time on the inside, having a lot of time to think and then maybe transform those thoughts into writing that helped you turn your life around? There's a lot of things that helped. Uh, Of course, my family, they're very disappointed in me, obviously, because what I did was not okay, and I never wouldn't make any excuse for it. It's something I feel really awful about and wish I could change. But my family were disappointed, but they supported me and provided me love. And uh, when I was in prison, there's not a lot of love in prison. So uh, having something like that, you realize how precious that stuff is because all the noise of life gets removed. But uh, I also participated in a writing workshop when I was incarcerated that was put on by an organization called Write Around Portland. And they did these like creative writing workshops. My first story got published as a result of that. And I also got to hear a lot of these other inmates' stories. And uh, and I also want to say just, you know, there's a lot of violence in prison, but there's also kindness. And a lot of the other inmates respected when I was working on my program 
And so, you know, there's random acts of violence, but there's also random acts of kindness. So uh, sort of all that stuff. And then also a lot of time to reflect as well. So, yes. And those reflections made it into Dog Years. It's a graphic novel exploring mass incarceration in the U.S. via anthropomorphic dogs. And these are dogs that resemble humans, right? Yeah, so uh, very much drawing inspiration from Art Spiegelman and Mouse, which is a graphic novel I thought was amazing. And I've been a big fan of Spiegelman's work, even some of the predecessor versions, like the the early versions of, of Mouse that got published. But I always thought... um you know, it's almost like sci-fi where there's this thing where if you displace the story into a slightly fictional lens, it almost allows people to kind of get over some of our preconceptions and really get into the story. And so uh, they used to do tours of the prison where they bring in, you know, civilian folks to tour it. And the way people would look at you, you really felt like an animal in a cage. And with respect to the genre of graphic novels in the first place, of course, they're widely consumed and very popular, especially over the last decade, 15 years. But they didn't always used to be. And you mentioned the word comics when you were growing up. I think there are still some people out there that have that misconception that, oh, these are just comics, right? If an adult who's used to reading books that are, I don't know, five, 600 pages in print and they pick up your book, they might be inclined to think, oh, well, this is for a five-year-old. Dispelling that, what age group would you say this is most appropriate for? There is some intense material. There's nothing anything too sexual or violent in it at all. But I would still say probably older teens would be the youngest, I would suggest. But, you know, that'd be a decision for each parent to kind of make on their own. In terms of comics and cartoons, I feel like you know, they weren't always for, for kids, right? They used right. to be big, big business back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I mean, they drove U.S. domestic and international policy. Lots of things were literally almost events driven by comics. And comic writers at that time were huge celebrities, Windsor McKay. And, and that led to the emergence of animation. Like animation directly came out of that. And animation wasn't even always for kids. It was sort of when Disney kind of took over the trade that it became that. So I see it, rather than saying it's a new thing that's happened, I see it's a return to an older mode of respect. And comics go back even way further, you know, the Bayou Tapestry. There's lots of ancient art that people sort of consider pre-comics. Scott McCloud is a writer who I think has done a lot of amazing work on kind of the, the cultural and technical modes of comics. But I think that what's also kind of particularly amazing about them is there are sort of a bridge between film and writing and they have visualization mm, so they engage right. different learning reading styles but they also still allow the space of the imagination so like uh, the gutter is what they call the space between the panels in a comic and even though it's a you know maybe an eighth of an inch it's got the infinitude of imagination between those panels and like writing where it engages the the inner eye uh, which is something maybe we, we've lost a little bit today, you know, with sort of the preeminence of video. So I just think comics are an amazing medium, an amazing bridge between mediums that allows us to activate our imagination, but also to kind of be able to see through the eye of the artist at the same time. Brilliant. Briefly, I don't want to spoil it for folks, but can you give us a basic plot summary? Yeah, uh, uh, it kind of unfolds with two timelines. The first timeline, it, it starts with Kurt, and this is where the book begins with Kurt arriving to prison, and sort of one of the timeline follows Kurt through prison until he gets out. And then another timeline is Kurt writing about his time before prison and kind of exploring uh, some of the stuff I alluded to about my life today, but about his first arrest and kind of his uh, descent into to crime from there that led him to prison. And those stories kind of converge right at the end. So it's those kind of two parallel time tracks unfolding and um i think it's kind of funny sometimes too i tried to make it entertaining and heartfelt but also amusing so jeff cronenfeld is author of dog years it's a new graphic novel exploring mass incarceration in the u.s via anthropomorphic dogs and we really appreciate you coming to word jeff thanks so much for your time thank you tom and thank you to npr just for all the great content over the years and kjzz you can find out a bit more about Jeffrey Cronenfeld on our website, word.kjzz.org. Coming up, how does an anti-anxiety drug work its way into the backdrop of a new mystery novel? 
Also, don't forget about entering the KJZZ Haiku Writing Contest. This year's theme, what's something you want to reset in your life? Find the link to participate on our website. I'm Tom Maxidon, and you're listening to Word. It's a podcast about literature in Arizona and the region. It's back. Join us for the First Press Fine Wine Dinner and Auction, Saturday, February 18th at Para in Tempe. Enjoy wines from Enriquez Estate Winery in Forestville, California, and Francis Ford Coppola Winery in Geyserville, California. For more information on this premier event, visit firstpress.kjzz.org. First Press is supported by the Friends of Public Radio Arizona. Whether your business is new or deeply rooted, large or small, you can share what's great about it while supporting a vital community service, KJZZ. It's a fact that listeners trust and support companies that sponsor KJZZ, and by becoming a sponsor, you build a stronger connection to everyone in your community. Get connected today at SponsorKJZZ.org. Welcome back to WERN. I'm Tom Maxidon. How does an anti-anxiety drug work its way into the backdrop of a new mystery novel? The House in the Pines is a mesmerizing psychological thriller written by Ana Reyes. We talked recently about her writing process and how she turned adversity into an advantage, but I opened with a quick question about the title of her new mystery novel. The title came to me after I'd already written a draft. I was bouncing around different titles, most of which I don't even remember now, but there was something about The House in the Pines that I felt was, it just had a nice ring to it, and it also kind of suggested this fairy tale tone that that I think I tried to weave in there. I want to talk as well about your background and your influence specifically in your writing. This is your first novel, as I understand? Yes. Your heritage is Guatemalan. How did that heritage influence your writing and specifically this particular book? The character in the book is half Guatemalan, like I am. And for her, part of her journey is coming to know and understand her roots in a way that she didn't growing up um, because she grew up here and had never been to Guatemala and wasn't really exposed to Guatemalan culture in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. A lot of that was autobiographical. I have a Guatemalan father. I grew up not knowing uh, much about Guatemala, just hearing stories from my dad and grandmother um, that were necessarily because they came here when my dad was a child, um, a lot of them sort of had this glow to them, this nostalgia um, for a homeland that, you know, they, that they'd left. So I think for me, um, that became really important, uh, that the idea of what Maya and, and myself had imagined about Guatemala versus the reality when she arrives there. There's other experiences as well that uh, you share with your main character. Tell us about those. So my main character, Maya, when we meet her, is going through Klonopin withdrawal. And at the time, I was going through Klonopin withdrawal when I started writing the book. Um, And it was something that I didn't mean to become addicted to. It was prescribed to me as a sleep aid. I wasn't warned about the addictive uh, potential. So when I then moved to a new state and got a new doctor, the new doctor said, "Um, you can't take this every night. You're going to have to quit. And she didn't really seem to believe that it was as addictive as it was. I'd been taking it for years at that point. And, you know, she just kind of treated me like an addict. Like she was like, no, I'm not writing you a prescription. (laughs) So the experience that I went through, clonopin withdrawal, I kind of uh, transferred to my character and I heightened it in her case, you know, for dramatic purposes but it's based on my own experience, the insomnia, the um, just the kind of disorientation of going through clonopin withdrawal was very informative in writing the book. One has to imagine that your insomnia clearly did not go away after you kind of kicked it, right? So did this yeah. leave you awake lots of nights wondering what am I going to do and then deciding, well, what I'm going to do is write. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, pretty much. I was in my last year of graduate school and I had to write a thesis. So a lot of it was, um, I've got to write something. (laughs) And I was just feeling very disoriented. So as I'm writing it down, it just sort of felt natural. And I was awake much more than I wanted to be. So in some ways that probably helped me um, churn out the first draft, even though it would change a lot after I wrote it. I think that just kind of being forced to write it and going through that experience helped me get it on the page pretty quickly. This is a thriller, so it is a page turner. Are you one of those people that does quite a bit of drafting or do you jump 
into the deep end, as it were, start writing and then go back and do some self-editing? The latter was my process for this book. I went in with a vague idea. I knew it was about this house. The house is always there. It always had the twist. Um, so I started writing um, and built a lot of the story around that. But now that I've written a novel and I've learned so much um, through the process of, of writing a novel, I think the next thing I write, I'll probably do more drafting before I jump into the deep end because that'll save a lot of time. It's natural. As you work through the process, you find out what works best for you. But when you're on a deadline crunch and in some ways, if you're trying to make a living out of this, publishers can be kind of antsy, right? It's like, well, when is your next one coming? Well, if you have to spend an awful lot of time going back and redrafting because maybe you didn't have a plan in place, I can understand how that might be kind of difficult. Uh, and is that part and parcel to why you've kind of decided to maybe switch tactics? Yes, absolutely. I think when I wrote the first book, I really wasn't sure how it was going to turn out. I knew what I wanted, you know, to to sell a book and and everything, but I didn't have the confidence that I have now having sold a book. Briefly, if you can, tell us about Maya's journey through the book. And of course, we don't want to spoil the ending, but what are her primary things that she faces? What are the ups and downs? So she's um, trying to move on after her, a difficult past. When she was a teenager, her best friend dropped dead while talking to Maya's first boyfriend, this uh, slightly older man named Frank. And when this happens again, seven years later, um, she only finds out because it happens on camera at a diner. He's sitting across from another young woman who drops dead. And so Maya realizes he had to have killed these women, even though he never touched them, even though there's no murder weapon, there's no proof. She feels certain that he had something to do with it. So she has to go back and come face to face with him. And what that ultimately entails is returning to the House in the Pines, which is this creepy cabin that he built himself out in the woods. And it sounds like this person may be a little bit of a metaphor for confronting things that you might not necessarily want to. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Ana Reyes, author of The House in the Pines, it's your first novel. I want to thank you so much for coming to Word and talking to us a little bit about the process of writing and also a bit more about the book, which folks can get. Great. Thank you so much for having me. You can find out a bit more about Ana Reyes on our website, word.kjzz.org. While you're there, don't forget to enter the KJZZ Haiku Writing Contest or tell a friend to. This year's theme... What's something you want to reset in your life? Stay with us as the beloved Festival of Japan, better known as Arizona Matsuri, returns to Phoenix in person the last weekend of this month. On display, even more haiku. I'm Tom Maxidon, and you're listening to Word. It's a podcast about literature in Arizona and the region. Your mornings can define the rest of your entire day. Find the $5 you forgot about in your pocket, that might be a good day. Get stuck in a traffic mess on the 51, probably going to be a bad one. But when you begin your day with Morning Edition, you start fully awake with the latest and most important news to prepare you for whatever comes next. Take control of your day and listen to Morning Edition from 5 until 9 on KJZZ 91.5. You have your favorites. Oh man, my favorite mug. And maybe it's about time to treat yourself to a new favorite. Mugs and t-shirts for you and the family are at shop.kjzz.org. So what are you waiting for? Welcome back to Wern. I'm Tom Maxidon. Our final guest on this episode is Emma Sansone. She's a drummer and member of the Arizona Matsuri Planning Committee. The festival, now in its 39th year, returns in person after a two-year virtual offering. The two-day event will be held at Steel Indian School Park in Phoenix on February 25th through the 26th. The festival also showcases a haiku contest, and Sansone began a recent discussion describing her hand in helping to organize the Matsuri as well as her participation in it. My main role is as a participant in Fushicho Daiko Dojo's taiko playing, but I am also helping out with the haiku judging. So I will be there physically on, on Matsuri Day, getting exhausted playing drums. The drumming is one of the most popular features, I would say, amongst folks who have been able to attend live and in person up until the last few years. But now you're back live again, as I understand. Yes, that is such a wonderful thing. The past couple of years during COVID, Everything was virtual, so we were recording 
um, in the studio or just outside the studio and then posting the videos, but it really doesn't have the same impact as when you're just attending Matsuri and you hear the drums in the distance and you go, oh, what's that? And then people come every time we start playing, the, the audience space fills up. And we have such a lovely audience space in the venue as well. It's still Indian School Park. We're right by the artificial lake and there's this grassy amphitheater where people can sit and watch. It's great. There's nothing like the sound of that to also sort of fill up your body. I mean, you can't get that from watching YouTube, for instance. Exactly. It, the physical impact of the vibration on you is something you can only experience live. Well, as we're recording this, the judging is going on, but this program is not going to air until it's over. I wondered if you could just recap what the theme was for this year. This year's theme was wa, which means harmony. Last year's theme was kintsugi, which is the art of, of mending pottery with a gold paste which we thought, you know, we were hoping to be live and we were hoping to come back and then COVID spiked up again. And so we had to stop. But this year, we really hope that the harmony of all the arts and the just the enjoyment, the physical sense of being there together is, is going to return and that we are going to get back into what Matsuri is supposed to be. It's bringing people together and celebrating. And that's sort of the purpose of the Haiku Poetry Exposition as well. In its ninth year, as I understand, and the festival has been going on for nearly 40 years. And so there are numerous reasons why people choose to attend from all over the state and, and also from all over the nation. What are some of the chief reasons that people have told you why they like the festival? When I'm there, I'm wearing costume, I'm wearing the happy for, for playing pretty much all day. And people recognize it and come up and say, oh, I love the drums. So I know that's one reason, but there are so many others. I, I love the way that younger people are interested in Japan from a, a new cultural point of view, um, the cosplay, the anime aspect. Um, I know some of the older people aren't quite so keen, but <laughs> it brings the kids in. Just a couple of days ago, um, Fushijo Daiko was performing in Peoria, and one teenager came up to us so enthused about learning Japanese at school and so knowledgeable about so many traditions that I'm really hoping that that's what Matsuri does for many more people, that it opens up many aspects of Japanese culture. And there's always the food, which is excellent. Right. And I kind of figured that anime and manga, for instance, was a contributing factor to so many young people. Uh, being I think so, yes. As far as haiku is concerned, of course, not everyone is a poet, but I've talked many times about just how accessible that form of poetry is to people. And do you think that that is a contributing factor to why so many people participate in the haiku poetry exposition and the, the writing contest? I think so, yes. At, at its most basic, it can be a simple descriptive statement. But sometimes I think without the author even realizing, it becomes illuminating. We've received some haiku from elementary school students that are just stunning um, in, in the way they, they hit you in so few words. And you think, yes, that's absolutely the way it feels. Yes, and picking up on that, Michael Dylan Welsh, is a pretty well-known haiku poet and a writer in general from the state of Washington. He started something called National Haiku Writing Month over a decade That's ago. That's right. And one of the phrases that he borrows from another author is to be astonished. And that's great that even the judges are astonished in reading these, and particularly from younger students, right? Yes. One of the, the best moments is when especially when you read it out aloud. We read them to each other uh, when we're judging together. And you see the change in, 
in our faces when when we're struck by the words when they convey so much in in such a short compact little unit Emma Sansone with the 39th annual Festival of Japan, better known as the Arizona Matsuri. I want to thank you so much for coming to Word and talking to us about this year's festival. Thank you so much for inviting us. Bye-bye. You can find out a bit more about the Arizona Matsuri on our website, word.kjzz.org. While you're there, don't forget to enter the KJZZ annual haiku writing contest or tell a friend to. This year's theme... Write a poem about something you want to reset in your life. Here's a couple haiku from those who have already entered the contest, which runs until Friday, February 24th at noon. Body Reset Can't eat what I want. Something always stops me. Metabolism. Cherish the outdoors. Cherish the outdoors. TikTok, Snapchat, Netflix gone. Hike, run, swim. Explore. Portions of this program have been nominated for Edward R. Murrow and Public Media Journalists Association Awards. I'm Tom Maxidon, and thanks for listening. Word. Word? Word. Was the word. Thanks for listening to Word, a podcast about literature in Arizona and the region. You can find all episodes online at word.kjzz.org or wherever you get your podcasts.